The first Special Service Force, famously known as the Devil's Brigade, was an innovative joint American-Canadian commando unit born out of World War II's strategic needs. Its inception was tied to Project Plow, a concept proposed by Jeffrey N. Pike to the British government in 1942, which envisioned commando operations in Norway and Romania. This idea was compelling enough to gain the support of Vice Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten and was presented to Winston S. Churchill, Franklin D. Roosevelt, and General George C. Marshall. Although Project Plow was eventually deemed unfeasible, it laid the groundwork for the formation of this unique combined force. Lieutenant Colonel Robert T. Frederick took the helm of the unit after the initial officer, Lieutenant Colonel Howard R. Johnson, was replaced due to disagreements over the plan's viability. Under Frederick's leadership, the force was officially activated on July 9, 1942, with a directive to prepare for winter warfare. This preparation took place at Fort William Henry Harrison in Helena, Montana, selected for its terrain and weather conditions, conducive to the specialized training required for their missions. Frederick was greatly admired by the soldiers of the 1st Special Service Force for his willingness to fight alongside the men in battle. On the beachhead in Anzio, for example, a nighttime force patrol walked into a German minefield and was pinned down by machine gun fire. Colonel Frederick ran into battle and assisted the litter bearers in clearing the wounded force members. The unit's establishment demonstrated a significant collaboration between American and Canadian military efforts with the original plan to include Norwegian commandos, modified due to the unavailability of suitable candidates. This resulted in a force composed equally of American and Canadian troops, trained for a variety of combat situations, including airborne operations, ski warfare, and amphibious assaults. Recruitment and composition of the 1st Special Service Force were notable for their unusual combination of Canadian and American soldiers, at first, they were also supposed to include Norwegian commandos. However, the inclusion of Norwegian soldiers was abandoned due to a lack of suitable candidates, leading to a force comprised equally of American and Canadian troops. This decision was made after realizing the strategic advantages and the logistical simplicity of forming a unit with soldiers from just two countries. Recruitment targeted individuals with specialized skills and backgrounds that would be advantageous in rugged, unconventional warfare scenarios. The U.S. and Canadian armies sought out men who were adept in the outdoors and capable of surviving and fighting under harsh conditions. Preferred recruits include game wardens, hunters, lumberjacks, forest rangers, prospectors, and explorers. These men were expected to have a level of physical fitness, mental resilience, and the practical skills necessary for the diverse and demanding missions the unit would undertake. The process of forming this elite group began in the summer of 1942, with a rigorous recruitment phase that led to the selection of around 1,800 soldiers, divided equally between the two nations. This rigorous selection process was designed not only to find the most suitable personnel, but also to foster a sense of unity and shared purpose among the recruits from different military and cultural backgrounds. A major divergence from conventional military training at the time, the first Special Service Forces training program at Fort William Henry Harrison in Montana was created to prepare the force for a range of combat scenarios, including winter warfare. This preparation was critical for the success of their future missions in Europe and the Aleutian Islands campaign. It was intense and comprehensive, covering a broad spectrum of combat and survival skills. It began with parachuting, a skill considered essential for the force's airborne operations. Soldiers started parachute training shortly after their arrival, with some experiencing their first jump within 48 hours, emphasizing the urgency and importance of this skill for their upcoming missions. Winter warfare training was another critical component, reflecting the original mission objectives in Norway. The troops underwent rigorous ski training, learning to maneuver in mountainous terrain under harsh winter conditions. This training was not only about skiing, but also included survival skills, such as building shelters and adapting to cold environments, which later proved invaluable during their deployment in the mountainous regions of Italy. Demolitions and hand-to-hand -hand combat were also key parts of their preparation, 
The unit was trained in the use of explosives for sabotage missions, a skill that would enable them to destroy enemy infrastructure and disrupt supply lines. Hand-to-hand -hand combat training, led by experts in various martial arts, prepared the soldiers for close-quarter combat, enhancing their ability to neutralize enemies in situations where stealth was necessary, or when they were out of ammunition. The extensive training program at Fort William Henry Harrison tailored for the First Special Service Force highlighted its mission's distinct needs, emphasizing the need for flexibility and the ability to navigate a variety of combat situations. This thorough training transformed the FSSF from merely a group of individual talents into a unified force with the expertise to carry out intricate missions in hostile and varied environments. The goal of this varied training was to forge a unit that could independently tackle any challenge, using their specialized skills to fulfill strategic goals without relying heavily on external support. The Devil's Brigade demonstrated exceptional versatility and effectiveness across several key World War II missions, starting from the Aleutian Islands to the challenging terrains of Italy, and contributing significantly to the liberation of Rome. The FSSF's first combat operation occurred in the Aleutian Islands, specifically on Kiska Island, under Operation Cottage, in August 1943. This mission aimed to reclaim the Aleutian Islands from Japanese occupation. Upon landing, the FSSF discovered the Japanese had evacuated, rendering direct combat unnecessary. Despite the lack of engagement, this operation provided valuable experience in amphibious and cold weather operations, setting a precedent for future missions. In Italy, the FSSF's prowess was put to the test during the Italian campaign, particularly at Monte La Defensa in December 1943. This operation marked one of the FSSF's most notable engagements, where they were tasked with capturing the heavily fortified mountain. Utilizing their specialized training, the FSSF executed a night assault, scaling the mountain's steep slopes under cover of darkness to achieve tactical surprise over the German defenders. This operation was crucial, breaking through the winter line and facilitating the Allied advance towards Rome. The success at Monte la Defensa highlighted the FSSF's capability to undertake challenging missions that other units could not, demonstrating their strategic importance in overcoming German defenses. It didn't take long. They were a good outfit. The Hermann Goring boys. Some of these German soldiers are good, and they were a good lot. So it was a, it was a tough fight while it lasted. Another big part, which is worth mentioning, is their involvement in psychological warfare. While conducting beachhead operations at Anzio, legend has it that a number of the force discovered the journal of a German lieutenant from the Hermann Goring division. The journal entry read, the Black Devils are all around us every time we enter the line. We never hear them coming. This tradition was never confirmed as true by any member of the Brigade, yet the force was known as the Black Devils and the Devil's Brigade. Members of the Brigade liked the latter. General Frederick had cards printed up with the unit's emblem on them, and the words, Das Dicke Ande kommt noch, or The Worst is Yet to Come inscribed in red ink along the right side. These cards were left after some of the battles they won and supposedly left a big mark on the German forces when they discovered them. Finally, they also played an important role in the liberation of Rome in June 1944. After enduring grueling battles and sustaining heavy casualties, their relentless push against German positions helped pave the way for the Allies to enter Rome. The first special service force was disbanded on December 5, 1944, after making significant contributions to Allied efforts during World War II. The disbandment occurred as the war began to wind down, and the need for such specialized units decreased. Many of the American members of the FSSF were transferred to airborne units, or the 474th Infantry, which engaged in further action with the Third Army and later served occupation duties in Norway. 
The immediate impact on its members was significant, as these individuals had developed a strong camaraderie and shared a unique combat experience that set them apart from other military units. Despite the disbandment, the legacy of the FSSF lived on, profoundly influencing the formation and ethos of modern special forces in the United States and Canada. All current U.S. Army Special Forces groups trace their lineage to the FSSF, adopting many of its insignia, such as the crossed arrows and the V-42 fighting knife designed by Lieutenant Colonel Frederick, as symbols of their heritage. Curious about your take on the strategic brilliance and shadow operations of this unit? Thanks for watching! If you enjoyed this video and want to see more content like this, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe to our channel, and turn on notifications so you never miss an update. See you in the next video.